All right. It's a lot of material here in Galatians chapter 3. You know, if there's one chapter that I, that I do usually choose to go to if I, if I encounter someone who, um, who's like a Zionist or someone who believes, you know, the Jews are God's chosen people and we need to bless Israel and, we, you know, and people who have been taught or brainwashed that, uh, this is, this is the, the one chapter that I go to first for sure because this chapter just destroys, destroys the concept that one, there is a difference between the Jew and the Greek, that there is any type of difference at all, and two, that, you know, that they are anything special because it really clarifies Old Testament scriptures. And we're going to get into, as we get into this chapter, there's actually quite a few quotations made from the Old Testament. We're going to look and see where all those quotes were made. We're going to see salvation by grace through faith in the Old Testament. Now, we've already seen that in the past two chapters. So I'm not going to just regurgitate things that I've already preached, but there's, there's still more to this chapter and there's more teaching in here that, um, that I want you to be able to see. And, and um, you know, these dispensations, these disp this dispensational beliefs where people believe that people used to be saved differently in the Old Testament. And, you know, some people don't even call themselves dispensationalists, but they just have believed or maybe they've always believed that people were saved by works in the Old Testament, and now we're saved by grace in the New Testament. And it's not the way it is. It's always been by grace. I know that's the way that I used to think before I was saved when I grew up in a Presbyterian church and just going to church is just kind of a distinction. Oh, yeah, the Old Testament, they did all these sacrifices and stuff. And in the New Testament, we have Jesus. And, you know, and like that was, that was the, the basic understanding that I had. Obviously, it was incorrect, but that's the way that I thought. And a lot of people think that way. But Galatians 3 really shines a light on the subject for us. So let's dig right in now to Galatians 3. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Now, this whole, all the chapters, you know, this is one letter to the churches of Galatia. And there's one main theme, there's one main topic, and what, he's, what the Apostle Paul is dealing with here in this epistle is the, the, the work salvation that has crept in and the people that were teaching circumcision and the people that were teaching other things. And Paul's kind of astonished here, and, and I've, I've done this already in a previous sermon where we've kind of gone through at different points where he's standing in doubt of these people and he's saying, did you believe in vain? And he's saying here, you know, who's bewitched you? Who is it that's enchanted you? Who is it that, that has, has made you, you know, change what you believe so quickly? And, and how is it that you're falling under the spell of someone who's coming in and trying to teach you these works? Because, you know, basically you say, when I was there, you received the gospel through faith. You, you realize it was just, it was not of works. It was completely a free gift. But now he's saying, you know, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? And, um, you know, this is interesting to see how far people can go and still be saved, you know, and kind of get off track with their doctrine. Now, Paul is definitely casting down, if anybody is preaching any type of works at all, I'm going to be casting down on their salvation too, and rightfully so. And this is what the Apostle Paul is doing. That's why, you, you know, like over and over again, you kind of see him saying like, did I bestow labor on you in vain, if it be yet in vain? Like, like how is it that you could even turn from, from receiving a free gift to now having it be like works involved or something? And, and, and that's why he's saying like he, he can't wrap his mind around it and he's using a lot of strong language because he really needs to, to drive this home and get them, if, if nothing else, to remember, yeah, you know what, he was right. He's already convinced us of this. Let's not have anything to do with it. Verse number two, this only what I learn of you, received ye the Spirit. So he's saying, I'm going to boil it down to this. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Obviously, there were people here that had received the Holy Spirit, and I believe that it was evident because when the apostles were preaching the gospel, um, especially back then, there was a lot of signs that were following when people would get converted. 
and they would be able to speak with other tongues and, and they would have other things. And he's saying, you know, you received the Spirit, so did you receive it because you were such a good person and because you obeyed God's commandment so closely? Of course not. And, and, and we know that, there, that there's no way that was the case. Paul was preaching the gospel. They received the Spirit. And he's saying, or did you, hear, did you receive it by the hearing of faith? And basically saying, that should settle the matter right, right there. If you receive the Holy Spirit through faith, then why are you trying to add any, any element of works to salvation? You receive that Spirit as a free gift, just like everyone else has, and don't tell me it was through the law. And he says in verse 3, are you so foolish? Are you so stupid? You know, being called a fool is a, is a big deal. So are you so foolish? You're acting so much like a fool, having begun in the Spirit. Are you now made perfect by the flesh? And you know, this is a perfect verse. You know, Galatians is great for people who believe in work salvation also. I mean, the whole book is great for that. But this specifically for the people who believe in faith plus works and the people, especially people who don't even want to deny that they're, they're adding works. You know, you got Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses that'll tell you flat out that you need works. That basically faith isn't enough. That, oh, yeah, no, 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 it's all by grace. They're always going to say, oh, no, it's just by grace. But you need to have the works too. Well, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? That's a good question. I thought it was the Spirit that would make you perfect, that would make you complete, that makes you whole. Once you've, once you've begun in the Spirit, then what do you need the works of the flesh for, for at all? What do you need the, you know, all of the, the, the adherence to the law? It's not necessary. Why? Because the Spirit is enough. Having begun in the Spirit, we're not made perfect by the flesh. And there's no amount of good works that you, you know, the people who think that, oh, we're saved by grace, but you need to maintain it, you need to keep it through the works. No. Are you made perfect now by the flesh? After you've already received it, received it? No. You can't be. It's a great verse. I love that verse here. Look at verse number four. Have you suffered so many things in vain? And again, this is where he's calling into question their salvation. And that's why he's just laying it out there. Just like, look, you, did you receive the Spirit through the works of the law? Did, you know, having begun in the Spirit, now is it the works that are going to save you? Have you suffered so many things in vain if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So now he's talking about himself. You know, he that ministers to you the Spirit. The person who's ministering the Spirit to you and works miracles among you. Uh, excuse me, you know, hello. The Apostle Paul is doing miracles. Do you think he's doing this by the works of the law because he's kept the commandments so closely? That he's able to do these miracles? No, of course not. He's doing it through the Spirit, by the hearing of faith. Verse 6, even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And again, we have another reference here to Abraham believing God. You can check out Romans 4. I'm not going to re-preach through all that. Romans 4 says the same exact thing. Even as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness, the same phrase is used. Yet people want to go to James chapter 2 and try to tell you, oh, no, no, you see, faith isn't enough. You have to have works. And, and you have two witnesses in the New Testament, both saying Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. And then in James 2, we have an example of the same story of Abraham offering up his son Isaac. And actually, I'm just going gonna, gonna to read James 2 real quick just so I don't um, screw up the the verses at all. It says in verse 21, James 2, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? And, and then this next verse says, Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. So in this chapter, in two places, it says, do you see how? Do you see now how faith wrought with his works? Do you see how that works? Yeah, we see how that works. Does that mean that, that works are required for his soul to be saved? No, because Abraham's soul was not saved when he offered up Isaac, his son, 
you know, when he's over 100 years old. Abraham is over 100 years old when he goes to offer up Isaac. He did not just get his soul saved in that moment. I'm sorry. So when we're looking at how Abraham's faith wrought with his works, and by his works, his faith was made perfect, we see that he actually acted on what he already had believed. He already believed God before Isaac was even born. He deemed God was able to do that which he promised unto him. And, and he trusted in him and he had faith in him. Years and years later, when he goes to offer up Isaac, yeah, his faith is, is made perfect in the sense that he's outwardly showing his faith because he does wholeheartedly believe that God was able even to raise up his son from the dead. Why? Because God prom made promises to Abraham that he trusted in. He made promises and talked about his seed to come and about, about all the people who were going to be blessed and the nations that would come forth from his promised seed. And he knew that. So knowing the promises of God and knowing that God can't lie, he was going to go through this, this, uh, this act of, of offering up his son as a sacrifice, as a symbolic act, but even just willing to go through all the way because he knows, hey, maybe he's going to be acting out the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But he knows, hey, God's able to do anything. God's going to raise him back from the dead because he's not going to let his promise fail. That's how, that is how, we see how Abraham's works mixed with his faith and his faith was made perfect, it was made complete. Why? Because he demonstrated that everything that he already believed. So James 2 is not some enigma, it's not some problem chapter, verses. It is not, it's definitely not saying we're saved by our works in any capacity. We have so many chapters and verses dedicated to just explain very thoroughly that it is not of our works. I mean, we're reading Galatians 3. He's like, are you so foolish having begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh, by the works of the law? They mean nothing. And he, and he goes on and on about this. And again, he even brings up Abraham believing God and it being accounted to him for righteousness. That it wasn't by his works or his obedience or anything. It was completely by his faith that, that counted him righteous, righteous in God's eyes. Verse number seven, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And that's a very important verse as well. When it comes to receiving promises made unto Abraham, when it comes to uh, the things of God, when it comes to just being of the seed of Abraham, being a Hebrew, right? Because you, you, there's different terms that we, that we use you know, we use the term Jews, but um, I'm going to get into a little bit later what that means. But typically, Hebrews is, is the term used for people who are children of Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when you go down that line, the children of Israel are called Hebrews. So, but what the Bible is saying here is that, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, those that believe the Lord, the same are the children of Abraham. I didn't write the reference down. I'm trying to remember exactly where it is. But it was um, John the Baptist was preaching and he said, you know, think not to say within yourselves that we have Abraham to our father. He says, for God is able of these stones to raise up seed to Abraham. And that's what the people were trusting in. And that's why he's making this abundantly clear, saying, you know, you think you're children of Abraham and that that means anything. He says, actually, you're not unless you're of faith. Why? Because Abraham was the, you know, the father of faith. It was kind of a, a name, that's a, a title that's been given to him. And he's demonstrated his faith. He's a very faithful man. God gives him a lot of respect. He's called the friend of God. He's, uh, he's a very faithful man. And the Bible clearly says here that if you're of faith, then you are also a child of Abraham. Verse number eight. And the scripture for seeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. This was the gospel. Now, I, I, I could not believe my ear. I heard someone recently 
try to make an, try to make a, an interpretation for this verse, which the Bible is not of any interpretation, no private interpretation. It says what it says, and it's very clear, and it's written in proper English, in English that makes sense. And it, this, this, this rivaled, when I heard this, this rivaled what I've heard Jehovah's Witnesses trying to make excuses for Isaiah 43 and Isaiah 45. Isaiah 43 and 45, the Bible says, you know, I, even I am the Savior, and beside me there is none else right? Saying that the Lord is the Savior. And when we're trying to prove the deity of Christ to these people and say, well, who's the Savior? Well, it's Jesus Christ. Well, look at what the Bible says. The Bible says the Lord is the Savior and there's no other Savior but Him, right? So who's the Savior? And we show this to people trying to prove, hey, look, Jesus Christ is not just the Son of God. He was God in the flesh. He's the Lord. He is part of the Godhead, the, the saving God that saves people, that's always saved people by grace through faith. And I've heard someone say once, oh, well, that just means beside, so like, you know, the Bible says beside me there is no Savior. He just means like standing right next to him. That's why I've heard someone say like, well, that, he, he just means like right then at that moment, like, well, where's Jesus Christ? Is it Jesus Christ at the, at the right hand of God the Father? You know, it's like they, they just want to come up and grasp at any straws they can because they've never even thought of that before. No one's ever brought that up to them before. But in their zeal to just hold on to their false doctrine, they'll just try to say anything and explain away all these verses because they don't want to acknowledge the truth. And I just heard recently someone try to say what this verse really says. Because it says here, and you can't get around it, that the gospel was preached unto Abraham. But see, these, these idiots that want to say that there's different gospels and different times and Jesus had a different gospel than Paul and they, 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 they butcher and destroy the word of God and don't let it speak for itself and don't just let the Bible say what it says. They have to go in and add their, their interpretations and twist the gospel and make all kinds of different gospels. No, when anyone normally reads this, you say, yeah, he preached before the gospel unto Abraham. <laughs> and, and it's hard to even, even look at this any other way, but, but here's what he said. He said, no, he preached before the gospel unto Abraham. Like, like, he pre like, like before the gospel was preached, he preached unto Abraham. That's how, that's how this person is looking at this verse. Like he preached before the God. Like that doesn't even, no one would speak like that. That doesn't even make any sense. And here's why it doesn't make sense because you have before and you have after. And it's talking about time here. And he preached before. Before these days, he preached before the gospel unto Abraham. And this is what he said saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. So that's why, and that's why he said in verse 8 too, and the scripture, foreseeing, right, in the future, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, knowing that the gospel was going to be preached to the Gentiles, knowing that that was going to happen in the future, that the heathen were going to uh, be justified through faith, preached before. Right? Foreseeing, he preached this before. Preached before the gospel unto Abraham. The gospel was preached unto Abraham because God already knew that the heathen were going to be saved by grace through faith. And that's why he said, in thee shall all nations be blessed. Why would all nations be blessed in Abraham? Well, they're going to be blessed because salvation is coming to all nations. That's the gospel, my friend. It's the good news. The good news is that it's not just for one group of people, but it's for all people. It's for all mankind to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. The gospel was preached before unto Abraham. Yes, the gospel. The same saving gospel that saved souls today was preached unto Abraham. You know what? The gospel was preached unto Moses also in the wilderness. It's funny how we could see multiple times that the scripture is saying that people in the Old Testament had the gospel preached to them. 
They're not a whole bunch of different gospels. It's one gospel. There's one gospel that saves. There's one gospel that's ever only saved. He preached before the gospel of Abraham, saying, And these shall all nations be blessed. Now, this is also very interesting because uh, I want you to keep your place here in Galatians 3 and turn back, if you would, to Genesis 22. We're going to see where this quote comes from. We're going to see where Abraham was promised, In these shall all nations be blessed, because there's other false doctrines that come as a result of this uh, statement or this promise made to Abraham. Because... This is not just a promise for Jews to have the land of Israel forever. This is not a blanket statement to cover any and all physical descendants of Abraham for all time. That's not what this is about. But we're going to see Genesis 22 where this, where this promise came, where the gospel was preached to Abraham. Genesis 22 verse 15, And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. And again, this is right after he was offering up Isaac. Okay, this is, this is, this is right at the time. Genesis chapter 22, you can see it in context. And that's, again, another reason why there's the, uh, the reference to Abraham believed God. It was a kind of right. All of these stories go together perfectly. Galatians 3 is talking about what happened in Genesis 22. Okay? So now he's saying, because I've seen this, because you haven't withheld your only son. Verse 17, that in blessing, I will bless thee. And in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. And we see here, you know, when it talks about his seed, the gospel is being preached. He says that, that all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. Everybody's going to be blessed through his seed. And we're going to see in just a minute that that seed that is being referred to here is Christ. Actually, let's just jump ahead in Galatians 3 because... It, just, it makes sense. Look at verse number 16. The Bible says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And the, the point is explicitly made there that he, he said it's not plural. So obviously we use the word seed and seed can be singular or plural depending on how it's used in the context and things like that. But this is being explicitly laid out to let us know, hey, this is not plural. This is not seed. This is not talking about all of his descendants. It's referring to one descendant in particular and that descendant is Jesus Christ. That is the seed. So God made a promise to Abraham and to his seed, not to all of his seed, not to all of his descendants, not to all of Israel, so-called, or these Jews that are over in the Middle East right now that are calling themselves Jews, that are really the synagogue of Satan. That is not who the promises were made to. The promises were made to Abraham and to his seed, which is Christ. That's who receives a promise. And the promise, there was actually a blessing being given here he says, it says that um, in blessing I will bless thee and multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Jesus Christ shall possess the gate of his enemies and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. How are all the nations of the earth going to be blessed? Through Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ was coming to die for the sins of the whole world, for every nation, for every language, every tongue, every people. Jesus Christ came and died for them, and they're blessed. If they put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, all nations shall be blessed. Let's go back, if you would, to Galatians chapter 3. Look at verse number 9. Galatians 3, 9 says, So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. So just like you know, the, the blessings that Abraham receives, those aren't just for Abraham, but 
Apparently, according to Galatians 3, they which be of faith are also blessed with faithful Abraham. Just as God blessed Abraham, hey, God will bless you if you are of faith. Why? Because God's not a respecter of persons. Because God doesn't care who your grandparents were and their grandparents and their grandparents and who you're descended from. That doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't even mean anything. You can have no control over that. There is no righteousness or goodness that comes out of who you were born from. Righteousness comes from faith. Look at verse number 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. And this is a very good um, argument, if you will, for for justification or righteousness not coming by the law that we can't be justified by the law i'm gonna th this this um this quotation is actually coming from deuteronomy 27 if you want to turn there because he's quoting it says for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse if you want to be saved by your good works you're under a curse if you're trusting in god's law that in your obedience to God's law to get you to heaven when you die, you are cursed. Why? Because it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Do you do all things all the time in the book of the law and do them? If you don't, then you're cursed. And this is directly from the law itself. Deuteronomy 27, verse 26. The Bible says, Cursed be he. And, and this, there's a whole list of verses prior to this talking about how you're cursed, you're cursed. Verse 26, so sums it all up. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them, and all the people shall say amen. Do you really think that the people of the Old Testament were able to keep this law? No. They were cursed just as much as we are cursed if we are trying to attain righteousness by following God's commandments and God's law because we've already fallen short. For all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And then in Deuteronomy 28, just flip over the next page, verse 58, we're going to see basically the same concept reiterated. It's not the exact quote. The exact quote was Deuteronomy 27, 26. But in 20, verse, uh, chapter 28, verse 58, the Bible says, If thou wilt not observe to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that thou mayest fear this glorious and fearful name, the Lord thy God, then the Lord will make thy plagues wonderful and the plagues of thy seed, even great plagues and of long continuance and sore sicknesses and of long continuance. He's basically saying you're cursed. You're cursed if you don't keep the law. And see, this is why people have always needed a savior. No matter what dispensation or age supposedly that you lived in, I don't care if it's in the past 50 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, 2,000 years, 4,000 years, 5,000 years, it doesn't matter. We've all, we all come short. Nobody is able to keep this law. No one is able to keep all of God's laws and his commandments. Look, Adam and Eve weren't even able to keep the one law that God gave them of to not eat of the fruit of the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil. That was their rule. That was their commandment. They couldn't even do that. And shortly after that, we see Cain, Abel killing Cain, or Cain killing Abel, excuse me. We see Cain killing Abel. We see, you know, just violence and people coming very short of the glory of God and not able to keep the commandments. And, and, and since day one, practically, we've needed a Savior. And that, but that's always been God's plan. That's why the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. God already knew what was going to happen. God knew Adam and Eve were going to fall. God knew, God knows, because God knows everything. So he's already had the plan set up from the beginning of what was going to happen to redeem his creation. Uh, going back to Galatians chapter 3, verse number 11, but that no man is justified by the law on the side of God, it is evident 
And then he gives another scriptural reference to the Old Testament. For the just shall live by faith. Now this is quoted, uh, I think, three times in the New Testament. The just shall live by faith. And this comes from Habakkuk chapter 2. You don't have to turn if you want to. Habakkuk 2.4 says, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. That's where the quote comes from. Again, Old Testament, Old Testament prophet preaching that the just shall live. We're justified. We live. We receive eternal life by faith. Not by obedience to law, because by the knowledge of the law, we're all sinners. We're all condemned. We're all guilty. We're all cursed. Because we don't follow every single aspect of the law all the time. We are cursed. But he gives multiple examples. Again, and it's like, what do these people need to hear? What else can they possibly, you know, be given evidence for. He's already explained to him. He's already shown him from the law. Hey, you better not be trusting in the law because the law curses you. And then he says, look, it's all Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. He brings up Abraham and he brings up this quote from Habakkuk saying, look, the just shall live by faith. This is what the Old Testament has taught. This is what the truth is. And that faith today comes through, it has to be in Jesus Christ in order to be saved. Galatians 3.12, And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Again, another reference to the Old Testament, to Leviticus 18 this time. He's explaining the difference. He says the law is not of faith. You either have the, the works of the law or by grace through faith. You can't mix the two. It's one or the other. The law is not of faith. The law was given as the law, as commandments. You don't need faith in that or to trust that. That's just the law. Faith is something that you believe in that you don't see. Faith is, is something that's different. The law is not of faith. It says, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. So Leviticus 18.4, this is where that verse, where that quotation is coming from. Ye shall do my judgments and keep mine ordinances to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. This is talking about keeping the law, which if a man do, he shall live in them. And that's what he says, the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. If you choose to live by the law, then you need to do all of the law. It's, it's all of it. And you know what else is, I, you know, I just thought about this too, but the people that want to mix in the law with faith and everything else and try to say that they're both required for salvation and a bunch of nonsense. You know, in James chapter 2, if you would just read a little bit earlier in that chapter, you'd see that everyone is condemned anyways. Because verse 10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Why? Because you need to keep the whole law in order to be justified in God's eyes. And none of us have. So when you break one part, one point of the law, guess what? You're guilty of all. And these are the same people that, that can't just read a little bit earlier in the chapter and try, oh no, you need works to be saved. As soon as you break one part of the law, you're guilty of all. What do you mean I need works? How is that going to save me? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the, by the flesh? Galatians 3. So again, we have all these references, and he's quoting the law, and he's saying, look, you've got to keep all the law. The law is not of faith. They're two different things. And, and over and over again, we see what the law does and what it is. And we, we're going to see here in Galatians 3 how Christ became a curse for us under the law. Look at verse number 13 of Galatians 3. The Bible says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And again, another quote from the Old Testament, just, just, just proving, just line upon line every time, saying, this is why. This is, you know, Jesus Christ redeemed us. From that curse, from the curse that we all are cursed under because we didn't keep all the law. And he had to be put to death. 
And he was made the curse for us. So the curse that comes from the law fell upon Jesus Christ. Not because he had his own sins, but because he was bearing the sins of the whole world. And that quotation about being cursed, curses everyone that hangs on a tree. And you say, well, wait, I thought he was on a cross. Yeah, he was on a cross. It was a wooden cross. And that's why they call it a tree, because guess where wood comes from? It comes from a tree, right? So they, they, they carved out a, a, a cross from a tree, and they nailed him to it. Uh, Deuteronomy 21, 22 reads, And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be to be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day, for he that is hanged is accursed of God, that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So it says when people are, are hanged, when they're hung up on a tree, when you nail them to a cross, when you crucify them, that's a curse. And that is a curse. What a, what a horrible way to die. It's a shameful way to die. It's a, it's a brutal way to die. It's a very torturous way to die. And obviously the person hanging up there is cursed. But the Bible even says so. And Jesus became that curse for us because that's what the law brings. The law brings a curse. And Jesus took that curse so that the curse can be taken from off of our shoulders and put onto Christ. And the righteous judge is still righteous because all of the, the aspects of the law that we broke, the punishment was paid. Jesus Christ came and paid every single last lick for the punishment that you deserve to, to pay but he took it instead of you. And judgment has been satisfied. Justice has been served when he became that curse for us. And he literally took the curse, as the Bible says, that you know, everyone that hangs on a tree is cursed. Look at verse number 14 here in Galatians chapter 3. The Bible says that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And that's going to be important later. We're going to see that next week, I believe. Um, the difference between the promise, right, and the promise that was made unto Isaac, or, uh, you know, uh, through Abraham and, and um, upon Isaac, not upon Ishmael, that, that he's the seed of promise, and um, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And that's why it's, again, salvation has nothing to do with the works of the law because the law is not of faith. But um, the promise is when, when God makes a promise, we just have to believe him. We have to believe he's going to hold his, his end of the deal. We have to believe when he says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. We have to believe that. We have to trust that. We have to trust that God's word is true. We have to trust that he's given to us eternal life. We have to trust him when he says it's forever. We trust him that it's not of our works. We trust him that's by grace through faith. We trust him in all these things. That's why our salvation comes by faith. Verse 15, Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant. Yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. This is an important point he's making. He's saying, look, the promise was made to Abraham. That's where the promise was made. We're having faith in that promise of his seed. The law came... 430 years after that, you know, Moses was given the law and Moses is a descendant from Abraham that came 400, essentially four, you know, some 400 years after Abraham or he was, you know, he was born 300 and however many years after Abraham, after this promise. They're saying the law came 430 years later. So, it's not like the law was there first. No, the promise was there first. The law is not going to disannul the promise. They're separate from each other. See, the, the, the promise is what people have always needed to be saved. You put your faith in God's promise. 
when the law came, that wasn't giving anybody any other way to be saved. It doesn't overturn the promise at all. The promise of the gospel, which was preached unto Abraham, is still coming, regardless of the law. The law didn't make it now that Jesus didn't have to come. For if, great, you know, if, if salvation comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So the law doesn't change the promise at all. And actually, it's, it's, uh, we're going to see what, what the law does for us. Verse 18, For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. He's saying if the inheritance, if our salvation comes from working, from serving the law, then it's no more promise. You don't need a promise for that. It's owed to you. You've worked for it. You deserve it, is what he's saying. But God gave it as a gift to Abraham by promise. Not through the law, not because Abraham was such a great person and he obeyed all of God's commandments. No, he believed God and it was counted him for righteousness. Galatians 3.19 Wherefore then serveth the law? So saying, well, then why do we even have the law? Where, what, what's the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Again, talking about the one seed, the singular seed, Jesus Christ. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, Verily, righteousness should have been by the law. Again, very important to understand that if people were ever saved by the law, if you're ever able to live a righteous enough life to be saved by the law, then righteousness would have been by the law. And then that's the way that people would be saved. And then that's just the way it would have been. And there would be no need for the promise of a Savior. You wouldn't need it because you can do it through the law. But you can't do it through the law. The law was given, it was made um, because of transgressions. Verse 22, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin. We're all sinners. And all of us are guilty. All of us have failed the law, the, the measure of the law. We all fall short. We're all under sin. That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. The promise by faith of Jesus Christ. Look, that promise by faith of Jesus Christ was given to Abraham. He didn't have to know the name of Jesus Christ, but he knew what the promise was. He knew that God will provide himself a lamb. Back in Genesis 22, we didn't read the whole story, but in, in him offering up Isaac, he tells Isaac before they even get up there that God's going to, you because know, his son's like, hey, well, where's the lamb that we're going to sacrifice? He said, God will provide for himself a lamb. He knew. He knew God was going to provide a lamb, and he wasn't just talking about a, a physical lamb. Because he knew what he was being called to go up there to do. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. This is why there's the law. It's to point out that you are a sinner. It's just to make it evident to you that you're not quite as good as you thought you were. People already have a hard time with this, even with the law. Imagine what it would be like without the law. That's why the law is there. To show us, hey, God doesn't want you doing this and this and, sit and, and, and fornicating and stealing and getting drunk. And, you know, and all. Wow, all of that is wrong? Yep. Because God said so. Because that's what the law says. And you're guilty. 
And, you know, people get hung up when we try, you know, every once in a while go out soul winning. We'll show people, you know, Revelation 21, 8, and it lists off all these various sins. and says, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And we always say, whoa, you mean telling a lie is bad enough to go to hell? Yeah, it is. But let's not forget about all of your other sins either. Why don't you just compare your life to God's law? And then you don't have to be hung up about one sin deserving hell because you have way more than one sin in your life anyways. You have a lot more. Let's just be honest with yourself. Let's just look right into that perfect law of liberty and compare ourselves and see, wow, I am really lacking. I'm going to look at this law as my schoolmaster to lead me to a savior because I need to be saved. And that's the purpose of the law. It's not to save your soul. It's not to, to retain your salvation. It's not something you have to keep or else you hope you were never saved. It's none of that. The whole point was to, was to point you to Jesus Christ. To show you, hey, you are not perfect. You need someone to save you. And guess what? God has already provided a Savior. Believe. Just believe it. And you can be justified by faith. The way that people have always been justified. Let's, keep, let's finish up the chapter here. Verse number 25, the Bible says, but after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. We already have the Savior. We don't need to be shown that there is a Savior. We already have Him. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. That's what makes you born again. That's what makes you a child of God. You're not a child of God unless you have faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And again, just, just kind of going back full circle to this. Uh, you know, there's, there's multiple things we could learn from this passage. But um, the fact that there is no Jew or Greek in Christ should be evident. I don't understand why people have such a problem with this. I don't know why. I mean... After that Christ has come, why, why would anyone still think to this day that there is any advantage to being some Jew in Israel? Why would, why would anyone even, what in the world would you, why, why would you think that? People got all excited recently because Donald Trump said that Jerusalem is the, captain of it, the, cap, the capital, cap, capital of Israel. If that's where we're going to have our embassy and that's, you know, why you get excited about that? You have a bunch of, of Christ-rejecting reprobates, wicked people, liars that deny the Father and the Son, antichrists, and I'm supposed to get excited because the president is saying that there's a, you know, the, the capital is Jerusalem? When there's nothing but wickedness coming out of that wicked nation that we should not be praying for, we should not be exalting, oh, pray for the peace of Israel, or Jerusalem. No, I'm not going to pray for the peace of Israel. I'm not going to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I pray that they get saved. That's about it. But I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm more, I am more of a child of Abraham than those people are in that land. And I don't care if I'm, if I'm Caucasian, if I'm some white boy saying that, it doesn't matter. Because I have faith. And the Bible says, if you be Christ, which I am Christ, then I'm Abraham's seed and I'm heirs according to the promise. I'm an heir. I'm not an heir by the works of the law. I'm not an heir by anything I've done other than receiving a free gift. And my inheritance is wrapped up with Abraham being Abraham's seed. Why? Because Abraham had faith and so do I. Why is that so difficult? Why, why are people still looking for anything coming out of Israel? There's no reason for it. None at all. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for these clear, clear, clear teachings from Scripture. 
Lord, help us to uh, know our Bibles well enough, know Galatians well enough, especially Galatians, Galatians chapter 3, to be able to show people um, that we don't, we shouldn't even care about, about you know, Israel or, or who's uh, physical seed of Abraham because that's not even what matters. What matters is whether or not we're of faith like faithful Abraham was because then we know that that's what's going to give us the inheritance and that's how we're going to be blessed just as you blessed Abraham, dear Lord. Uh, we thank you for that, that promise that you made. We thank you for fulfilling that promise and in Jesus Christ, the, the seed to whom the promise was made, dear Lord. I pray that you will please just help us to show other people and, and, and point other people to that Savior, to, to Jesus Christ, dear Lord. I pray that you will please just embolden us and help us to be more effective in reaching people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.